course. And um, so it's, it's already recorded. Don't you worry about it. You know, we can we can um, we can have more than one attempt, but I can also edit whatever we you know. If you're saying actually, let me just do that bit again. That's fine. I'll, I'll carry on recording and I'll edit later. So you know, just be completely relaxed. Um, so I'm I'm here. Are you um, are you happy with me? I'm going to mute anyway because there's going to be I will have background noises here as well. Are you happy with me switching off my camera but still speaking into the camera to me? The main thing is I need a, I need a, an audience. So even when I lecture, we lecture in pairs of two okay. lecturers because what everyone realizes in the last eighteen months. If you haven't got a face, you sort of freeze up. Okay, that's fine. I mean, ten I'll minutes should be fine. That would be lovely. I'll stay on. Can so I even take... in the... Sorry. Even in the BPS conference, so the chair, yeah, the director of the BPS, the you know the forensic section, she basically was there. <laughs> so it's it's interesting because I do um I don't lecture. I'm I'm, I'm applying for jobs as a lecturer at the, at the, as a lecturer at the moment, but I don't um. What I do is I do these live streams um, every Tuesday, and um, and you know so sometimes I do these events as well. So I, I am talking to myself in the camera, but then I'm I'm used to that now. I've been doing it for a few months. Yeah. Whereas you guys, I'm, I mean, it's a completely different thing. So I mean, I I, I, I mean, I miss an audience. You know, I I yeah. pretend to love, die and everything. So anyone who knows me and knows my training knows how and how interactive I normally am. Yeah. So it's killing me just being in a room on my own, let alone. But all my police training is face to face. What we've all realised, you can't do police training of interviewing remotely. Yeah, I think we've all learned that. Though Andy Griff has actually done a little bit recently with with America, but generally, but he's got put it interspersed with um, lots of online live stuff at least. Yeah, but but, there are challenges definitely. Can I just take so because stuff. you're looking a little bit sideways into the camera? Where will you be looking when you do this? Okay. No. Yeah, better. Okay, great. So um, I'm recording. I'm going to mute. Are you happy to start or do you, do you want to? Yeah, do you want me to introduce myself as well? Um, the people no, I'll probably, I'll probably do that. So if you can use okay. your, your time slot for you know the, the, the goodness that you're sharing, that would be great. Um, and yeah, do you just, like I said, just, just deliver your thing. If there's something you want to do again, just to say it and, and do that part again. And then yeah. when you're, when you're done, let me know and, um, I'll unmute myself, but I'll mute myself now, but I'm here and I'm listening. I'm your audience. Okay. Today I'm going to talk about the cognitive interview. Now, most of you probably would have heard of the cognitive interview. It's trained all over the world to a lot of investigative organisations. So I'm going to give a little insight to what this cognitive interview actually is. I'll give a little bit of a history and then I'll explain it and how it works in the real world. I'm very fortunate. I train the cognitive interview to police pra practitioners um, on a very regular basis. So um, I'm used to trying to utilise this technique in the real world. So let's first of all, look at what it actually is. So it's a model of interviewing, and it was developed by two cognitive psychologists who were in America, Ed Geisman and Ron Fisher. And how it even started was there was um, a detective from the LAPD. And he realized that when in the real world, when he spoke to witnesses, when he asked questions, he seemed to be putting words in their mouth. And there were things left in his brain, you know, in their brain. And he said he just didn't know what to do to get that bit of information that seemed to be left without sort of contaminating it. So he went to his local university, met Ed and Ron, two cognitive psychologists, and they came up with a cognitive interview. So this is such a good example of where a real world problem. So a police officer going, what do I do? Goes to a university. And then something is developed in partnership and the cognitive interview this was in the early 80s so the cognitive interview has really changed and morphed over the years and generally the change in the morph is due to real world problems when we're seeing it in practice that works that doesn't work so i'll give a little example of that of how it's morphed over the years but it's a real world problem 
which has been solved by Siri about memory and communication. And it's a tool for practitioners to use. Now, the main aim of it is to gather accurate and reliable information. Now, as investigators, your job is making decisions. And there's one thing I always say, as a decision maker, yeah, to make good informed decisions, you need good information. Yeah, because good information is fed into your decisions. To get the good information, you need to ask the right questions. So if you're not asking the right questions, you're not getting good information, which means you're also not making good decisions. And it's a real chain event. So good questioning, good information, good decisions. And that is really important, whatever type of investigator you are. So the cognitive interview, the aim of it is to gather that accurate, reliable and fulsome information. Primarily for someone who is cooperative, be they witness victim or suspect, be they client. But as long as your aim is to get accurate, and reliable information from someone, the cognitive interview is your model. Now, when they first created it back in the 1980s, the first ever publications actually in 1984, it consisted of four primary techniques. And these four primary techniques aimed to facilitate memory, to help memory, and also to ease communication. Now, before I go through what the four techniques are, I want to explain why they had to look at this two pronged approach, memory, and communication. Now that interviewing process to get that information to make good decisions has two sort of two parts to it. The first part, as I always say, is gathering that information from memory. Mm -hmm. You get it here. The second part then is relaying that information to another being. So that's why you've got the memory bit. And then you've got the communication bit. And that's why we need the two areas. Now, let's look at memory first of all. Now, when I train the cognitive interview, I normally do a whole day on memory theory. So to really understand how to interview someone, you need to know a lot about what this memory is. I'm gonna pick a couple of things. The first is that we all know through lots of research that memory is incredibly, incredibly fragile so fragile it's easy to contaminate it so easy and as i always explain and i'm sure people who have heard me talk before you know when you go to you know i always pretend to die in my training and i always say right when someone's died what's the first job we do well first of all is preserve life the second thing is actually preserve the scene and what we're trying to do to stop preserving the scene with police tape around it is to stop the contamination of the forensic scene. However, what I always say, I would love to put police tape round everyone's head at the scene, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, because the brain, this memory, is a scene in its own right. And I always liken that brain, that memory scene to snow. And you wake up in the morning, you've got a field of white snow. And we know it's really easy to contaminate it, to walk footprints along that snow. So that's the problem. This memory from the scene all the way through the justice system is so easy, so fragile, so easy to be contaminated. You've almost got to see it as like a little bit of snow in your hand that you've got to try and protect. But the criminal justice, what I call contamination timeline, doesn't really protect that fragile memory through the process at the scene itself, the frontline police officers, then you might have a formal interview, then you've got all the way through in our justice systems. But think about memory is really, really fragile. That's the one thing. But also when you say to someone, tell me what happened yesterday or this morning, people also will need help to uncover that memory, which is accurate and fulsome. You can't interview yourself. I'm doing a lot of work with um, critical incidents at the moment. And, you know, in the past, if a police officer has been witness to an event, they're told to write their own handwritten statement. But we know 
that's one not a trauma informed approach that's not the best thing for them to process their own trauma but secondly also you can't interview yourself you need someone else to help you take and get and gather that information from the brain especially if it's a complex event which is dynamic and the person is traumatized so we have the whole memory going on we also have different types of memory and the different types of memory will affect um, how you interview so you have something called episodic memory episodic memory is a one-off event you know so a terror attack is a one-off event and we know this episodic memory when you say to someone tell me what happened they construct it right it's a constructive memory yeah you piece it together almost like a jigsaw puzzle okay and that is easy to be contaminated the cognitive interview is mainly the best for episodic events okay then you have um, semantic memory and a part of semantic memory affects our world as investigators and it's called scripts. Now script memory is what typically happens in certain scenarios. So when you go to a restaurant that you go to quite a lot, you tend to have the same every time you go. Yeah, well you, do, you look at the menu, you do a little cursory look, but you still end up having what you normally do. And that's because humans hate the unknown. We loathe the unknown. So from a very young age, we start developing scripts of what typically happens in certain scenarios. So we can expect what's to happen and we don't have to fear the unknown. And children start developing and we would obviously develop them into adulthood. Now these scripts of what typically happened are less detailed. They are more generic. So certain crime types, really you're playing with semantic memory or script memory, domestic abuse child abuse these events that happen more than once and these types of events that are you know um multiple events we are dealing with these more general memories they're not as detailed as an episodic memory and episodic memories i will say imagine you go on an airplane for the first time and an assault happens the brain goes it loves an episodic memory <laughs> it sucks all that juicy information in it bags it tags and what we call flags it but that's episodic memory. Script memory is more general. What typically happened when I'm abused as to domestic violence now, and that's when we have difficulty in a, you know, an investigation because certain criminal justice systems, and I know this is absolutely true to Patrick Tidmarsh's heart, and he's one of the other speakers, is that most justice systems want individual incidents, which is so difficult when it's more of a scripted memory event. So there are tools to help us unlock what we call the episodic flags if they exist in that person's brain. The third type of memory is more procedural memory, like the act of driving, not the route. The route back to is if it's a usual route will be semantic memory. If it's an unusual route, episodic memory. And um, procedural memory is almost like your muscle memory. It's in your bones and the really the only way to access that is through demonstration. So when we look at interviewing, we look at the process, but also the product. So if we're interviewing about an event, which is procedural, you have to visually record it because your way to access it is through a demonstration, acting it out. So it's really important, as you can see, with that little bit of you know, snippets of information, how police officers and investigators and anyone interviewing for memory needs to understand the types of memory because the tools yeah, are linked to the type of memory we're trying to access. The second area was communication. Now people sit there when we start um, putting in interview training packages into organisations and I'm very fortunate. I've been part of um, many organisations across the globe sort of embarking on creating investor interviewing strategies within their organizations and people say to me becky why do we need to train people to talk we've all been talking for a very young age can't we just learn from our colleagues who are more experienced now unfortunately we know through interviewing through lots of research is that experience does equal competence you can be interviewing 40 years badly so that is one thing we've all learned from multitude of cultures across lots of research. 
you need to have experience and the knowledge of investigation and the points to prove and the law. I'm not talking about that, but actually the act of interviewing. So why do we need to teach people? This is really quite fascinating. Now, one way to start working this out is by looking at everyday conversation. So if we don't train someone, they will rely on their everyday conversation. And if we look at our everyday conversation in life, what we find is people tend to use very closed and leading questions. They also learn something called the maxim of quantity. And the maxim of quantity is a really interesting concept. We learn from a very young age that detail is not required in everyday conversation. So when someone says to you, did you have a good holiday? Yeah, we know that they don't want the full information. They don't really want to see the photographs. If someone says to you, did you have a good day? Yeah, I'm a little bit naughty in work. And if I'm feeling a little bit bored, I walk down the corridor and if someone says to me, do you have a good day? I tend to say no. Right. No. People aren't prepared for the no. Try it, guys. Really funny. Right. And then you say, oh, I'm only joking. The relief on that person's face when you say I'm only joking is immeasurable. All right. And that shows that we don't deal in detail. So with everyday conversation, we use closed and leading questions and we know closed and leading questions results in less detail, which is less reliable. Wouldn't want to base my investigative decisions on that type of information. And also we have these conversational rules. So work started realizing in the early 90s, the evidence base. that in fact, we need to teach investigators to talk differently. Right? That was one body of work. And, you know, there's a whole load of research of how long does it take, to, you know, to train and most of it's in the policing world to train police officers to speak differently. And there is now a model of um, practice that's, you know, there's a lot of research base about what we need to um, create in an organization ethical investigative interviewers. Yeah through the training package, what they need to be trained, what type of information do they know, the knowledge, um, and also they've got to have a good quality assurance mechanism around it to support any training package. You can't do it in large groups, it has to be in small cohorts, which is immersive training. So there's a lot of research now to show that what you need in a training package of investment interviewing to transfer into the workplace. But then there also had to be a lot of work to create tools to help investigators help the general public overcome these everyday conversational rules too. And the cognitive interview is part of that. So I'm now going to go through the four cognitive interview primary instructions. So the first is the report everything instruction. This instruction, and now you can see, that's why I had to tell you about the memory and the, you know, the communication, because even a regular adult, you tell them, tell me everything, don't leave anything out. And we know even regular adults withhold more than they spontaneously report. Okay, so when I say to someone, tell me everything, they have to get the information. Everyone, they will make a decision. Do I tell you, do I not? Do I tell you, do I not? And that's even people who are cooperative and wanting to help, they will withhold because they won't think it's relevant, not important, that you already know, a whole host of things. So that report everything instruction is so important and it covers all those. Please don't leave anything out. And of course we tailor it depending on the individual. So if the individual is part of a larger um, investigation and they know the police have interviewed other people, they might withhold because they think the police already know. If there's CCTV, they might withhold. So we do tailor this technique to the individual and the circumstances of the investigation. But the central tenet is, tell me everything, don't leave anything out. Now, added to that is something that we call the demo technique to demonstrate the level of detail. My trusty water bottle goes around the world with me. So what we do is demonstrate the level of detail yeah, that we would require would love in an interview 
obviously with an object which is unusual that would stand out on the table um, and I'm going to describe to the level of detail that would be great in a witness interview. Now normally we just say it's a water bottle with looks like water in it okay however this is the sort of level of detail that would be great so it's got a brown top and it's matte it's plastic matte brown also the handle you can see the handle here it's a different material so it's not just what i see but it's also what i feel we have five senses so we can feel the handle the material now that pattern that pattern is quite difficult to describe okay verbally because i've taken it away so if we describe it think about how you would describe it well it's hearts going in different directions cut in half with different colors how would you explain the size of it of each heart and you know immediately what am i doing i'm using non-verbal behavior so as soon as a witness uses non-verbal behavior then they have difficulty verbally describing something that pattern is actually easier to draw so a good interviewer would have lots of um, paper, lots of colored pens. Um, so witnesses can draw things they have difficulty describing. There's also, and you probably can't quite see it, there is a little bit of writing, just there, writing. Now, again, that's difficult to describe. It's at the bottom of the bottle, bottom of the side. And you're like, oh, is that is, that's much easier, the size of it and the location to draw. So some things are just much easier to draw. So when we ask people to draw, and don't forget a suspect is just a witness with a twist with the same memory, yeah? Now, when someone um, is having difficulty to describe, drawing could be a baby. Now, a common error with drawing and sketch plans um, is that people magic the paper up and then people often say, oh, I can't draw because it's a bit of a surprise. But if you at the beginning of the interview have paper and pen, then it's not so much of a surprise. And if you explain why, because that's easier to draw or anything you have difficulty to describe, then it's not so much of a mystery. So drawing is not just necessarily a sketch plan of the location, it could be an object. It could be anything they have difficulty describing verbally. So that is what we call the demo technique. So we link it to drawing. Now, don't fill in the gaps, don't guess, just what you actually remember is fantastic. Now there is water. Well, it looks like water. Now is it water? So don't fill in those gaps. We have our smell. Smells pretty bland. Anyone who knows me gin every time, I'm joking, right? But we have taste too. And of course I would not do that in an evidential interview. However, on a training we've got to be a bit of fun huh so we have five senses now that's the sort of level of detail will be fantastic now i'm going to place my water bottle in front of my interviewee and i'll keep reminding them that this is the sort of detail i require conditioning condition them to give us detail now i've seen it done um also not so well where people have described a pen but then it gets lost on a table. It needs to be relatively unusual. And also it needs to be linked to drawing, I think, for it to have its full effect. So, and also the five senses. And it's nice to have a logo or something which is difficult to describe, but much easier to draw. So, demo technique, part of the report, everything instruction. Second cognitive interview technique is called the context reinstatement instruction. Now, we know that context has a powerful effect on memory, very powerful effect on memory. To the extent you bump into someone, I bumped into someone the other day and we did the old, we had that feeling of familiarity. I recognised them. I knew I knew them, but I couldn't place them. They're out of context. I bumped into them in my butchers and she was my dentist. It took me two hours to work out who on earth she was. She was out of context. But if I'm at the dentist surgery, I wouldn't do the old, you know, I'm very quiet in the dentist, not quite very often. Dentist and running, two times I'm quiet, can't talk. So context is really powerful. Now we know through research that if the sort of what we call the encoding context, so if the context where someone witnessed the event, yeah, if the learning, as it place it goes into the head is similar 
yeah, to the retrieval environment, i.e. where they're trying to remember it, the better the memory. Now, this would suggest us to take our witnesses and victims back to the scene. However, there's problems with that. And indeed, there are about five problems with taking someone back to the scene. Could contaminate their memory, could contaminate the scene, could be time consuming, logistical issues. The scene, you know, might be um, in a war zone, risk to the, or it might be in the middle of a park. Yeah, and of course, it could be too traumatizing for the individual. So there's reasons not to go back. But we're not, so we never say never. You know, what we always do is on the tool of the tool belt of the inquiry, we say, do an interview recorded first, and then it's a potential to take them back, maybe to scene after, once we've taken all these other considerations in, you know, into account. However, we know that getting people to think in their brain about the context helps their memory. Now, the easiest way to do that is get someone to draw a sketch plan back to drawing. So we know through research that such as Coral Dando first did, um, um, we looked at the use of sketch plans and we know just getting people to draw a sketch plan about an event is a really good memory tool. Now, a common error is you not, you know, I have seen investigators actually draw a sketch plan for the witness, which seems a bit odd. Um, it's about their memory. The sketch plan will not be an accurate representation because it's a memory tool. That's something we also need to keep in mind. Or it doesn't look at, you know, it may be a small proportion of where the event happened because that's what's important. Um, also, I've seen people not actually ask the witness to um, narrate, to describe what's happening when they're drawing. It's also important, you know. They can do a little bit of do, 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 and then describe fine, but make sure that they describe and also useful if they label it. Obviously, some jurisdictions, they need to sign it as part of the evidence bag. But the key is, if you label it, that is your notes ready for questioning, because that's a really good representation of what they've got in their brain. So we have sketch plans, but then we also have the full mental reinstatement of context which basically is getting people to close their eyes and for you to help create the picture of the event in their head. Now we do context in two places. We normally do it at the beginning, um, which is helping globally or molar context, but we can also do it at various elements when we break it down as part of questioning later, molecular context or mini context. And that's where it's used. So it's basically getting that person to think in their mind's eye about the scene. Now, I'll demonstrate it very quickly because we've only got 10 minutes. I'm sure I'm running out of time already. But, and it could take 10 minutes to do. But the key is, and the reason is to explain to a witness victim and suspect, if we use it with suspect, is why we're doing it. Now, to explain that the scene is part obviously of the event. Now, getting them to close their eyes is helping them free their mind up. And what I mean is I as an interviewer are a distraction. So the reason I get them to close their eyes is purely so they block out me, the biggest distraction in the world. And I know I really have to, I'm very handy as you've already gathered. So when I interview, I have to calm my own nonverbals down massively. So, that's one reason we say close your eyes because it just helps you think and I can be a distraction. I will try and be as calm as possible myself as an interviewer. Then, of course, we say the other reason is because it helps memory and we give them a real life example. So when you've lost something like a set of keys or a pair of glasses, what do we tend to do? We try to retrace our steps in our head and think, were they in the car? Were they here? Were they there? because that helps our memory. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help them create a picture to help them retrace their steps in their head about the, the incident under investigation. So we get them to close their eyes. And then, you know, we also tell them actually beforehand that we're gonna go slow. And then we'll say over to you at the end and that's for their time to free recall. So this tends to 
come in at the end of the sort of the instructions at the beginning. So we get them to close their eyes or look at the floor if they feel uncomfortable closing their eyes. And then we list a set of things. So at the beginning, it's at the start of an interview, it's very general. So think of the scene, if the interviewer knows it's at a bridge, think about the bridge, think about the layout of the scene. Think about, it's almost like painting a picture in the head, think and think about how you paint a picture. So think about the event at that time. Think about the people that were there. Think about the objects that were there. I'm doing it quite quickly, guys. Normally it's really slow. Think about the colours that were there. Think about the sounds that you remember hearing at that point, time. And think about how you felt. Now, very important, another common error, it's not reliving. It's not present tense. All the research validating these techniques is in the past tense. If you notice, I use past tense. So again, that's another common error. So I know when people haven't been trained properly is when they say, oh, it's reliving. It's helping memory now for the past. It's not putting them back there. <laughs> that's really important with this instruction because the research base, the evidence base is all in the past tense. So the third technique is of the original four, change perspective and change order. These are third and fourth. These are used less frequently in the field. And to be honest, these are better to be used on an advanced interview course because people find them quite challenging. So the change perspective technique is not about change of location. I've heard it that you're a bird in the sky. You've got no memory of being a bird in the damn sky, right? This purely is about shifting personal perspective which is very difficult because you have the as if type of nature, which is a problem in the in the, um, the legal world. However, I was doing some training in New Zealand and this New Zealand police officer, he'd obviously, he was on a, an advanced tier three, as we call them in Britain, witness course. And he came back after a couple of days training. He said, Becky, can I call it spotlighting? Can I put it, put in someone in spotlight, this change perspective? And I went, Love it. He goes, I read the original research. He said, it's really, it's almost like, so what we're trying to do, and it tends to happen in the questioning phase of the interview, what do we tend to do is we get someone to think about a particular person in the event. And what we do is we get them to spotlight that individual, like they're on a stage. And if they're on a stage, if just thinking about that person and their actions, what they did, frame by frame, action by action, yeah, about action. So it's still their memory. It's not changing. It's just thinking about individuals in their own memory. And that's how we train the change perspective technique these days called spotlighting. The final technique is the reverse order recall or change order. And this is really for one particular memory problem. And this is some, if someone is stuck in the groove of script memory, I normally on a Friday I meet Don, Dave and Sue and I normally do this and I normally do that. Now, if we've got someone stuck in the groove of, um, of script and we want to know what happened on the Friday night, one way to help that is say, what was the last thing you remember? What happened just before that. So it's a way of getting what we call script inconsistent information. So it's what I call also the rusty tool. <laughs> It's the one, you know, when I talk about um, interviewing, now we train it, you know, something called the enhanced cognitive interview. Those are the original four. The ECI, the enhanced cognitive interview, was first written in a book by Geisman and Fisher in 1992. It has morphed quite a lot recently. Um, and really, there's sort of three areas, getting the social dynamics right. We realized by looking at field research of of um, witnesses and police officers interviewing witnesses in the field, but just giving four cognitive mnemonics probably wasn't, you know, the best for transference. Great, great initial start by Geisen and Fisher, of course. But when we started realizing, when interviews with adult witnesses started to be recording in the real world, we could see what was going on. And so we can help more as 
you know, as academics. And one of the main, main problems was perhaps um, a lack of good questioning and also rapport building. Now, I know Lawrence Allison will do a whole segment on rapport building and all pit. But even with a cognitive interview, we know that getting those social dynamics right is key, facilitating communication recall, and of course, maximizing memory, as I've said. And so there are extra tools added to the enhanced cognitive interview, such as what we call transfer control, giving control of the information flow to the interviewee and work that I've done with one of um, my PhD students, Patrick Risen in Norwegian police, when he looked at um, how, how, how police officers managed trauma from the, the victims who were on the terror attack on the island um, in Norway. And one of the key things, the big learning from that was they need to feel in control. There needs to be control over the flow of information. And that's what's so important. So transfer control of the cognitive interview is perfect for that. So when we deal with lots of traumatized individuals, transfer control is key, absolutely key. So the last sort of 10 years, really, we've all dedicated ourselves to try and looking at real world adaptations of the cognitive interview. And, you know, as I said, with the terror attacks that I've worked on, um, transfer control is really key. Um, in a war crime scenario with interpreters, we're actually trialing at the moment um, a morphed method with the use of interpreters, which is looking really, really, really promising on that case. So that's what the future will hold, is us working in partnership more and more with practitioners, which is absolutely key. As I said, it started off as a real world problem and a police officer coming to university, and all the way through, and that's why it's so successful, I think, because all the way through, it's really been a partnership and an engagement between practitioners and academics working together on real world problems. And that's why the cognitive interview has morphed over the years. So I hope you've enjoyed this section, this little segment, and I'm sure I've done more than 10 minutes, so I apologize. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And please don't be strangers. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. It was a, a lot I can see I the builders. I can see the builders desperate to carry on. Go back to work. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I could see that they were 